My name is Stephanie Samdi, and I am a sophomore studying here for the spring semester. It is my honor to introduce you tonight to Ima Vitelli. Ima Vitelli is an international correspondent for Vanity Fair Italy. She joined Vanity Fair covering the 33-day Israeli war against Lebanon in the summer of 2006. Ever since, she has covered conflicts in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Somalia, Israel, the Palestinian territories, and many other countries. She covered the Arab Spring in Tunisia and in Egypt and was one of the first foreign reporters to travel to Benghazi to tell the story of the beginning of the Libyan Revolution. She has worked in some of the most dangerous areas in the world and shared heartbreaking stories through her reports. Last semester, she joined us here to speak about her investigation of the routes that the migrants take from Eritrea to Italy. Her experience allowed her to fully understand the plight of refugees making the journey to Europe. Tonight, she is interviewing Amir Adam, an Eritrean refugee who made the trip himself to talk about what has happened to him since arriving in Lampedusa and what it is like for a refugee to settle in Italy. We are looking forward to hearing in Amir's own words about his experience. Please join me in welcoming Emma Vitelli. Thank you, Stephanie. And hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be again here, and thank you for having me. Um, we were supposed to be three tonight. I was supposed to, we were supposed to have another guest whose um, name is um, Tame Desta. Tame is uh, a survivor of the big shipwreck in Lampedusa that happened on October 1st. 2013, but as Amra pointed out, these kids are good at, you know, catching boats <laughs> with smugglers, but he missed the plane. Like, <laughs> airports, European cities, now. Nah. So, <laughs> he didn't make it. And uh, um, with Tami, we were supposed to talk about uh, the last part of the journey. It's like people who arrive in Sicily and then they move north beyond Italy, you know, most of them right now, nowadays, they settle down um, in Sweden and Norway. But as the Arabs say, Malish, Basita. Well, Amr Adam helped me tremendously when I was investigating the route of the migrants from the Horn of Africa to Italy, to Europe. The reason why I focused on Eritreans and the Horn of Africa is because one out of three of the people who do arrive in Italy are, in fact, from the Horn of Africa. And uh, I'm not sure you're following the news in Italy, but today was all over uh, on the covers of every single newspaper. Um, 400 people just died. They found 100 plus bodies. The other ones are missing. Since the beginning of January 2015, 20,000 people already arrived. It's enormous. It is something that we're dealing with every single day. As we speak right now, um, Frontex, which is the European <coughs> Union force uh, agency dealing with migration, uh, is probably out in the waters of the Med rescuing people. Amr Adam um, is one of the first Eritreans, part of this new wave of Eritreans. I'm like, he arrived in Italy back in 2007, so he is part of this pioneer of this vanguard of people who arrived from the Horn of Africa, fleeing his country, Eritrea. And his life, the more I talked with him throughout months, we've been talking, because he was helping me with my investigation, the more I talked to him, the more I was like, this is not a life, this is a film, this is a movie, this is a book, it's like Hollywood. I mean, really, a script writer should write his story because in the end, he not only took the boat, he crossed the desert, he did what everybody was doing and still doing right today while we talk, while we speak here. Um, but he managed, once he made it to Libya, and he's going to tell us also this part of the story because I think it's very compelling, he actually made it because you know how dangerous the sea is and how many people actually drown. He actually managed to put a boat together. They bought a boat and then they, they drove their own boat. How cool is that? It's like no smugglers were involved. They bought their own boat in Libya and they made it on their own, basically, to Sicily. And he will tell us about that. Amr Adam is part of the um, middle class of Asmar. His father was a famous soccer player in Eritrea. Um, and then his father decided to move to 
Saudi Arabia because there was a good job waiting for him there. Worked for an Italian company building highway. Amr was born in Riyadh. He speaks Arabic fluently. Then he wanted to be a journalist. He went to Cairo and studied journalism. But then there was this part of, you know, of, of, of Amr Adam that had never actually kind of lived in his own country. So he moved to Eritrea and he worked in the Ministry of Information in Asmara. And I'm going to ask him why a person like you from, from the middle class, your father, everybody knows your father in Asmara, decided, decides to flee. Like, what was it? Okay, the it's not an easy job to, I mean, it's not really easy to decide at a certain point of your life to quit your family, to quit your house, to quit your country, to quit a very comfortable situation. That is, that is, I was compelled to leave because the situation there was really difficult, because of the political situation. People were buried in prisons underground. I'm a journalist and uh, my duty is to transfer the knowledge to people and not to be an instrument of the regime. And as a journalist, I, I couldn't do my job as I wish. This is, and as you all know, in my country there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of expression. And uh, as a journalist, it wasn't a good place for me. You can, you can find it in many articles, in many journalists have spoke about it. It's well known that in Eritrea there are many and many and many prisons where they keep where they keep journalists and where they keep people that are not aligned with the regimes. How did you make it to Sudan? Well, Sudan was the nearest country I could reach. It was the easiest country to reach. I had to work for, for two entire days. You normally travel at night because during the day you're not allowed to leave the country so you can be shot by soldiers and it's extremely dangerous because you're in the middle of nothing and you can find animals, predators or every kind of danger you can imagine of. So I had to sleep during the day and work throughout the night. What happened once you made it in Sudan? Once I reached uh, Sudan, I was supposed to relax because <coughs> I finally left the country where I was not comfortable. Uh, but um, I know what it means being a, a woman and doing the military service. I know what, what kind of situation is there. So instead of just sitting back and benefiting from the change, I had to do something for my sister. So. My main concern while, while, I, while I was in Sudan was how to also help my sister who was there in Eritrea. So I changed my identity and I came back. I went back to Eritrea as a different person. The reason why I changed my identity, including my name, is because that would allow me to officially marry my sister. With a new identity now I could marry my sister and eventually take her out. So basically, let me just explain you a little bit of background for people who are not familiar with what we're talking about, because it might sound weird, okay? He's, he's in, he finally is, uh, is in Sudan, and then he decides to go back, and of course he's pretending to marry his sister, right? He's, he came up with this cunning plan. His worry was that his sister would be abused sexually by serving in the, the, the uh, indefinite uh, military service. In Eritrea there is this indefinite conscription and abuse is rife especially for women. And there was a time when women got married, they didn't have to serve, they didn't have to do this military service. So Amr Adam thought, okay, if I go back to Asmara with a different, under a different name and I marry her, she's going to be married to this guy and she's not going to, you know, go through the military service and no one is going to rape or abuse her. This was his plan, which is, you know, kind of bizarre, but people in extreme circumstances do bizarre things to survive. And if I may add, uh, and in addition to that, if, especially if you get married to a person who legally uh, resides in a foreign country, you're also entitled to, to, leave. to leave the yeah. country. This is also the second yeah. reason. So, so there was this hilarious part in Asmara. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Um, he can't just, just get married and then that's, that's the end of it. He needed to really go through the traditional way of how marriage is done in Eritrea. So he literally married his sister. They organized a huge party with everyone and he went to the mayors, you know, and he registered everything. So at the end of the party, he forgot that he's making up the whole thing. And he said, okay, dad, so now I'll go. He's supposed to be the father-in-law in principle because they're making up everything. So at the end of the party, he says, okay, well, okay Dad, no, I, I should go. That was the funny part. <laughs> um, and then, then the sister, I'm happy to report, is happy and fine. I don't know about happy, but she's in Canada right now. And all of this because of this fake marriage in Asmara. Um, then you went back to Sudan, and life in Sudan was not exactly easy. Life in Sudan is miserable, it's terrible. You have two options. You uh, rather go to, to, the, to, the, to the camp, the refugee camp, and you're protected by the UN system, or you are not protected and you, are, and you hang around, but you risk to be arrested by the, by the police, and normally you have to pay, you have to pay a fine or you have to bribe um, the police in order to, to be released, because there is a, 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 there's an agreement between the two governments, the Eritrean government and the Sudanese government. So they also threaten you that, they threaten you to send you back to your country. So, and that's actually, to, to avoid that, you're compelled to, to pay all the time. So, whilst you're there, your only thought is, how can I leave this country? How can I go from this place? When, when is it that you decided that you had enough and you had to go to Libya? So I already described the pressure we had whilst we were in Sudan. Uh, in the meantime, I got married for real this time, and my wife got pregnant. And um, when I left my country, I was not looking for somewhere, and then and then I I was not looking for to go to Sudan and then from Sudan live to somewhere else. I was chasing peace. I was trying to see where I could, where I could start a new life. But uh, the pressure there was too high and I had to think of the future of my son. So I decided to, to leave the country. You, de you decided your wife is pregnant, and there was this moment that, that, that was very, you strongly described it to me. It was like, only in a sudden I was going to have a son, and I didn't have anything to offer him. I didn't have a future for him. So you just disappeared. You didn't inform anyone. You just took the road with smugglers, a very dangerous road, crossing the desert on the way to Libya. Would you like to describe a little bit how it was like that experience of crossing the desert with smugglers? One of the most remote areas mm. of the world. So when you take a decision, it's not, it's not easy. You, you try to make a decision bearing in mind that that is the only way out of that situation. And you are well aware of the, how dangerous the smugglers are, how dangerous the way is. But then you hear of people that they make it. They go through it. They, they are able to go to, to reach Europe. And their, and their lives change. So you hear of these positive stories and you hope that yours is one of them as well. So on, although you know of all these dangerous um, things that you have to go through, but uh, you have no choice. It's like when you're drowning, you, have, you try to, to, you know, to, to, grab, to grab whatever you have, just hoping that it will save your life. You tell me stories of human remains and tremendous thirst and ghosts at night. So um, he was describing the first, the first day. Normally, your your main concern is to try to to leave the the lived area, try to avoid try to uh, avoid encountering police because you may be captured. Try to are they going to capture me? Am I going to be able to to leave this place? The second day, you start discussing, arguing, and then. You start fighting each other, and the third day you have nothing. You, have, you see the, the sky and the sand. Nothing but the sky and the sand. You see bones. You see your water is, is finishing. Your, your food is finishing. Your, that's the only moment when you really, your main concern is, am I going to survive? And this, and this concern is what bound, what, what, what bound us. 
so we try to take care of each other, trying to, you know, trying to ensure our survival. So uh, he was, he was um, describing the situation where he were, they were seeing, they thought they were ghosts, but they were tired, they were thirsty, they were hungry, so they had hallucinations. So they were imagining people to come towards them or... So, and when they asked the smugglers, what, what is this? Are there ghosts, real ghosts? Say, yeah, it happens, because they're quite used that people in that condition, after the sun, after you know, the, the, the tough, the rough conditions, they have hallucinations. And um, your main concern is water. Everything, all the dialogues between people are around water. They say, where is the water? Do you have some water? Is water finished? Uh, give me some water. So even the children that I used to say, dad, man, dad, food, or they start saying water, water. And because that's the, what they hear every time. And it happens that they call their mom water because they repeat it so many times and then it becomes the main, the main word. So you survived the desert and finally you made it to Libya where life, as you described it to me, was just hell. Libya. In, uh, it was in, in, in Libya, once, once you reached there, um, you're, you're treated as, um, as goods, as merchants. So they, they, they arrange you in queues. Eritreans, Ethiopians, Nigerians, you know, and, and they are rated, you know, like gold and silver and, you know, those people are, so you're, you're, you're treated as, basically as, as animals or as, you know, goods and slaves. as slaves, yeah, and you would say as, because they're rated, they give you, you know, the price for, as, as you were, you were not human. So normally you pay the smugglers to take you from one place to another, no? So when you reach a place, and then you're sold again. So since Eritreans really experience really tough life, they know that they want to leave the country, so they normally they save lots of money, and they have family, and uh, they help each other, each other. So they're considered as a, as a very, you know, valuable goods. And, uh, and actually, smugglers are really happy to deal with with, uh, with Eritreans because that means they're going to become rich very soon. So they're really proud of having a group of Eritreans because they know they have money. They know that if they don't have money, even their family will will be providing for that. For so you're sold every time you reach the destination. You're sold to another smuggler who will sell you to another, to, who will sell you to another again. Um, in Libya. Once you made it there, you start doing all sorts of different things because your objective was to find peace and it was obvious that peace was going to be somewhere beyond the sea, you know, in Europe. But in the meantime, you start doing all sorts of stuff, helping the refugees like you, because you had the only thing that no one else had a fake Sudanese passport. Do you want to tell us a little bit what you did with that? Which I think it's an amazing story. Okay, I believe I'm sorry. Uh, well, when he arrived in, in Libya, he, he, he did so many things. He worked as a gardener, he was doing cleanings at a certain point. He did really different kind of, of tasks. And um, he saw what, what pressure were subject to all those who are not Libyan. Um, for Libyans, those who are not Libyan, it's enough not to be a Libyan to be not considered a, as a human being. So not, li not Libyan means you're not a human being. One day he was near the hospital uh, and he saw a Nigerian lady screaming. She was giving birth. The waters broke already, and uh, she was screaming. And he knew a little bit of Arabic by that time, so he said to the to the, to the guy, "Why is she Why is she crying? What's happening?" He said, "Oh, but she's not Libyan, and she doesn't have a document, so she's not entitled to to a health care. She she can't access the hospital. That's why." So he saw all these kind of difficulties. He says, "I have to do something." So and he thought of having. Of, of having, of producing a fake 
a fake Sudanese passport to go around. So the passport is fake. So as he was telling, um, since they really ha they really hate those who are not Libyans, they were not even they wouldn't even bother to recognize if someone is Sudanese or Eritrean or Nigerian. It doesn't really matter. He's black, and uh, that's enough to make him not a human being. So with his fake, what he was telling me with his fake passport. So every every time that a woman needs to give birth. He would go there and register himself as her husband so that she's entitled to go to the hospital. So every time a woman would go there, he would go there. And uh, by the way, uh, you, she cannot have the medical health if someone, in this case the husband, doesn't donate blood. So every time a woman needs to give birth, he, was, he would donate blood to, to, you know, to, to compensate her, her, her medical treatment. No. Uh, so basically, he is the, uh, uh, the, 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 so the, Libya, the, the official father of something like 15 children. <laughs> and he did that just because the situation was so bad and he saw this woman who was, whose waters were breaking, she was about to deliver and they kicked her out because most of the refugees, of course, don't have any paperwork. So they don't have an ID, right? He also came up with this cunning plan of faking uh, a Sudanese ID, and then he became the guy to call whenever a refugee had to deliver a baby. And he started doing this in two hospitals, and they didn't recognize that there was the recurring father, father and the baby, so all these <laughs> different mothers, which I thought it was hilarious. The only problem that he had it was this, he was doing this yeah. like once a week, and they took his blood, and it's like, <laughs> it just like, he didn't have enough energy. But then, it, then it becomes, it becomes, it's such a, and, and then of course he would go up, and the real father would wait in front of the hospital. Right? Because real father couldn't get in, no papers, no nothing. He was the one pretending to be the father. And then one day, actually, one day, there was this horrible thing. All this humanitarian work took a turn, you know, towards okay. the grotesque, actually, because what happened? When he went to, 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 uh, to assist another, another lady who was giving birth, this time happens that the lady gave birth to a, de to a dead child. He was the registered father, and he had to go down, they said, to the obituary. And uh, they say, okay, you're the father now, we give you the child. So they gave him the corpse of the, child, of the dead child, because the system doesn't foresee, you know, burial, official burial system. So he finds himself with the corpse of a, of a child, and uh, he can't, so he, ca he goes out of the hospital, he tries to, to grab a, a taxi, but um, no taxi wanted to, to assist because he, he had a dead child on his hand and uh, they were horrified by the, by, the whole, by the whole idea. Fortunately, a Tunisian friend came to help him and uh, together they took him at his place. Burial issue is not really easy because he's a foreigner in Libya. And he goes with this, with this dead child to the cemetery, and they tell him that he can't bury, he can't bury the, the, the child because they need a sort of um, declaration from the government, from his government. In this case, he has the Sudanese fake passport. So from the Sudanese government, he should have a sort of permit that he says, this child can be buried uh, officially in Libya. Only that he's got a fake um, passport, so he can't go to his embassy and uh, and ask for a permit for uh, to ask for uh, for a document. And um, he had no clue on what to do with the corpse. So he goes back home. He removes all the food from the fridge and he keeps him in the in the refrigerator for three days, trying to see how to go about it. After three days, he goes to an internet point and um, a brilliant idea comes to him. He said, you know, the, the Libyans are obsessed with green, probably because they don't have that green in their country. So he wrote in, in nicely written green on the internet. He prepares this nice document, this declaration that, that says from, we are the embassy of, of Sudan and uh, uh, we, uh, we, we allow the, the child to be buried in 
in, in, in Libyan so, territory and uh, he makes, he tries to find, he finds somewhere a stamp and he puts a stamp on it and he takes the, the document to the, to the cemetery. And they actually told you to dig. So um, the reason why we're telling, uh, I'm, I'm asking him this story is because it just really, it really does tell you what is it like and what feels like to be a refugee in Libya. We heard the story of slavery in the Sinai, uh, torture, but there is a whole different level of things that we can't even begin to imagine. And dinner after dinner, I was talking to Amr Adam, a journalist, a fellow journalist, a colleague, somebody who studied journalism all over it, who all in a sudden, because he decided to have a future as to bury the child of someone else um, in Tripoli, faking a, a document. It's just mesmerizing. But while all this was going on, your father managed to track you down. Your, your, your you know, beloved father was in Asmara. I was really upset with you because you disappeared, leaving behind your wife, your pregnant wife, he managed to find you and send you a picture of, of your child who was born in, in Khartoum. And this was happening also at the same time while you were helping all these women actually delivering their babies. And in fact, the last one that you helped, the last baby that you helped was the one you took with you to Italy. Do you want to tell us about that? The way you actually kind of took the boat to Italy. So while, while he was helping all these women, in, and he receives a message from his father. He was, this letter, he, he found to trace him and he sends this letter. It was full of insults because he disappeared and uh, he was, he, no, they were not aware of where he is, how is he doing, but um, he sent, me a, he sent him a picture of his son, and he saw finally that he is a father. And as a father, he's got a responsibility. And he needs to really take care of his son and his wife. That's when he really decided that he needs to do something. That's when he took the decision to leave the country and to come to Europe. But um, he was um, he was telling a, a funny story that when they are when you are at the checkpoint wherever you are there are these checkpoints and they 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 always keep your passport they have to analyze it and normally it's normal process so when they called him they would he would for, he wouldn't respond because that was not his real name so he would forget his fake name again and then they would have to call him several times before he reminds that that's him. So the moment you kind of realized you had enough money and the plan was, you knew that the sea was very dangerous, that a lot of people never make it. It was, it still is. And so with a bunch of people that you met there, Eritreans, you, you came up with this plan that you were not, you, you were going to take chances, but as, you know, as few as, as, as possible, that, that you were going to not let the smugglers decide your faith. And so you bought a boat, basically, uh, and basically it was 28 people. And, and then the guy who was going to be the captain of the boat was a guy who used to be in the Navy in Eritrea, in Massawa. So he, he was a man who actually knew how to do this. He knew the sea. And, um, on the boat with you, there was a little baby, the last baby that you fathered in Libya. And uh, you spent the last three days, if I recall correctly, in a, in a warehouse full of chickens, you mentioned. But how was the sea? How was that experience? So, um, when you have to take uh, the boat, uh, they have to make sure that, that the vigilants are not there, so they normally keep you near the coast, the coast areas, and they hide you somewhere that is, they cannot think that people are there. So in his case, he was kept there for three days, for three, four days in a so, huge uh, warehouse where they keep, yeah. the farm where they keep chicken. So imagine three days, 
Yeah, and, and there are chicken all over. And since then, I really hate the sound that um, that uh, the chicken make. If I see a chicken, I really hate it. I can't stand it because it reminds me of those tremendous three days. Um, so we were. You when you have to depart during the night because to avoid controls and everything. And you, and when you hear the the sound of the waves you really start to get scared. And even the person who is well known to be the most courageous, the most strong, you know, the strongest person, you hear them really fearing or crying or, or so. And with me, I had, um, I had the, uh, my friend's wife with a, with a child, one week old. So I took the child in my arms and while the others were preparing the boat. So when they transport you from one place to another and when they before taking before taking the boat to avoid all check all the all the controls, they keep you in a lorry with sheep because they are you know they're far and uh, you stay under the ship literally because you, I mean even if they if they if they are see, looking at it and uh, you, you they can't see the people because they're down you're totally covered by the ship so once you get out of the you get off the lorry everyone has the s smells like a ship so, <laughs> so you try to see and everyone has the same bad smell and you left from, uh, not from Tripoli, but from a place called Homs, and uh, you had with you a GPS, and basically, um, after the first day, the second day, you told me you were about to run out of fuel, and already you were running out of water and food, and then what happened? <coughs> So the first day when we did, when we departed, it was, of course it was dark. You were silent. Your main concern is to escape and not to be noticed. And uh, a few hours, six hours later, people start complaining about the space and hey, you're touching me. This is supposed to be my part. Uh, but then the next day, you are, you start uh, telling jokes. Uh, you start to socialize more. But um, in the third day. They finished food, they finished water, they are hopeless, but they find themselves near Malta. They try to stop a boat who was passing by and they tried, they were, they were ignoring them basically. So they had to show the child, a one week child, to attract their attention. So finally they come, they, they provide support, but they call also the police. Now the Maltan police, police, they come, they're, and, and now they're only 200 meters from the coast. So they could see the, the cars moving and everything. The police comes, they say, okay, we give you what you need, but you're not coming here. And they give them the directions to Italy. You have to go to Italy, no, but not here. Very nice of the Maltese. Go to Italy, not here. You're not allowed to come here. So they redirect them to Italy. Very nice. Very welcoming. So they're trying to, to get rid of the, resp the responsibility. So what they do is they give you all, all the support you need. They give you water. They give you food supplies. They give you fuel. They, if your if your motors and if the engine is not working, they give you a brand new engine, but they say you're not allowed to here to come here. So what they do is even even when they give you water, since they don't want to have you know political frictions with Italy, they remove the signs of the Maltan uh, brands so that you can drink water, but you cannot tell them that you were caught by by Maltan police. So they give you everything, but said not here. Go to Italy. They are near, we're really in Malta, I mean, 150 meters from the coast, and yet they are being asked to go to, to Italy, which was really far away, six or seven hours of travel. And uh, finally, they, when they reach the, the territorial waters, they are traced by the radar, and the Italian boat comes to, secure, to, to save them. And that was like landing. You landed, so it was this harrowing journey that took, that took you years, basically, because you were in Libya a year and a half, and you were in Khartoum for, what, a couple of years, I think. 
In Sudan, due anni sei stato? Sì, a Khartoum. Quindi era quasi un viaggio di quattro anni che ti arrivi finalmente in Italia e tu hai detto, sai, quando ti chiedevo, sai quello che il tuo obiettivo era? Sai quello che volevi fare allora? Se volevi restare in Italia, se volevi andare a nord, ti amo la tua risposta. Qual era la tua risposta? Cosa era quello? People when they travel, they already have something in their mind. They, for example, they are, they think they want to go to Germany. They want to go to Switzerland or to Norway, where the social assistance is really, I mean, is really good and uh, refugees are treated very well. Um, but when he left the country, when he traveled, and he was doing all this, all this travel. He had something in mind, he wanted some peace, but most importantly, he wanted to have back his identity, because no one knew him. Throughout the whole trip he did, no one knew who he was, what was his real name, where he comes from. He never had a real document, he always traveled with fake documents and identity, stolen identities and all this kind. He needed somewhere where People know who he is and where he could live as himself in peace. So he called his father and said, look, I reached Europe, I, I reached Italy. His father previously lived in, in Italy, so he knew the country very well. And when he asked for, when he asked for suggestions, he said, what should I do? Should I, do you think I should go like all my friends to the north? He said, just try. Just try how, how life treats you there. And then, and then you take it from there. You spent about three weeks in a, 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 a centro di accoglienza. In Italy, you have these first aid kind of centers where refugees are processed. Um, they are, uh, you know, taking fingerprints. They're fingerprinted, and um, and then eventually, after these three weeks, you were taken to a train station. And that was your first day of freedom in Italy. And it was like. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> it's like... So the most important thing he had is document, finally. Yeah. So, yes, his document, he's got his identity, and uh, the funny thing of Italy is they give you your nice document, and they take you to the station, and then... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> now it's up to you. Goodbye. And yeah. Goodbye. This is your life in Italy. Yeah. And uh, imagine someone who comes here for the first time, has no clue of the Italian language, no clue of where the places are, no clue of where he needs to go, what he needs to avoid. He hears someone say, oh, Palermo. He says, oh, pa Palermo is a city. Let's go to Palermo. And then he goes to Palermo. So in Palermo, he uh, doesn't know the signs of men and women on the, to on the public uh, toilets. So a friend of his who didn't understand where he should be going, he follows this lady uh, uh, who was going to the toilet and she's scared that the foreigner who's following her in the toilet, she calls the police, so they were stopped by, by the police. So, uh, when he was a child, he, his dad brought him to Rome once, so he could, he had some childhood memories of Rome, so he said, you know what, maybe I should go to Rome, it's a big town, I'll have many opportunities, let's give it a try. So, he came to Rome, but um, he was staying in a, in a park, actually, he had no house, he had nowhere to go, and no money, and no, but no money, of course. So he was compelled to sleep in the middle of the park, just just behind the Colosseum. So they were they were calling the place a hotel. So wherever whoever tells them where they go to sleep, they would tell them, oh, I go to a hotel, of course. So that, were, that was their hotel, and once a friend came with them and then they said, so when it's time to go, to, you know, I would like to sleep. Shall we go to the hotel? 
He said, but you are already in the hotel. We are already in the hotel. Can't you see the million stars? <laughs> So, I was in the hotel. What if Star of the Limousine, like the Hazard of the Seven Hundred? Because this guy was asking how many stars. How many stars does, does your hotel have? Thousands, thousands, thousands of stars. Thousands of stars. stars. So, <laughs> can't you see the stars? Can't you see the stars? Like, it's the best hotel in the world. Thousands, thousands. Don't you, mean, don't you see the Colosseum? It's nearby. It took you, because we need to wrap this up, this is fascinating, but it took you about, I think, a couple of years. To because you because you were really you knew what you wanted you wanted the respect you wanted an ID you wanted a piece of land this is exactly the way you described it to yeah, me yes. a piece of land where you could live in peace and have your identity and so even though Italy is not very welcoming towards refugees you basically were there and 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 started working at Porta Portese which is this market in Rome selling. You were telling me you're selling bags, and then you were selling drinks, uh, water, and sodas at the stadium, you know. And then step by step, you know, the city of Rome provided uh, some schooling in hospitality, and then eventually, finally, and this is our ending note, finally you were able to tell your wife yes. and your son legally to join you in Rome because you had a job and you had a home. Life can be really tough, um, but not for this reason your choices should, I mean, not for this reason you should give up. You should always think of how can I improve where I am. So even if you are in a really bad situation, your life can improve incredibly. Or you can stay in a very comfortable place and your lifestyle can drop incredibly. So the good thing is that you have, you have a hope, you need to have objectives and see what you want to become. And once you have already what you want, your objective, your long-term image, and then, and then you can work. It's just a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you. So many things he could tell us because, as I told you at the beginning, his life is a film. But I guess um, we should leave some room for, for so some time for questions. Any questions? He speaks. Ita he speaks so many languages. But I wanted to make sure that he did this in a language that he was really comfortable with because we only have one hour, and uh, he could have done it in Italian. It would just have, would have taken a bit longer. Yeah. Hopefully, I, next year I have uh, Italian citizenship. It's going to be yeah. one of us. Yeah, next yes. year. Yeah. It's like it's now it's uh, eight years. I can have after five years I can ask it that. I'll be his witness. I'll be there. <laughs> yes. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's very inspiring that after so many struggles you managed to achieve your goal. And uh, when you told the part about the desert, crossing the desert to reach Libya, I was uh, curious how many people were with you because you said that you were talking to each other and then I was just curious like, how big was the group of people so that you could support each other. Thank you. There are a few seats where they travel. Normally you travel with uh, West Africans and people from the Horn of Africa, they kind of mix day, so they normally travel in groups of 40. Um, and uh, when you travel, you don't have really seats, and you oh, imagine seven hours of, of travel, and you have no option to sit or to, to re relax or anything. So and normally you give the place to ladies or to pregnant women, and it's really tough. I mean, you travel standing all the time. Hi. Uh, why did you decide to stay here in Italy and uh, you didn't go in Northern Europe? Okay, it's a it's a bit of stereotype, but um, you know, in North you have really good social assistance. They will give you a nice house. They will give you lots of money, but then the culture is is a bit is a bit different than how he conceives. He needs, you know, human human beings. He's a he wants a, a warm place where he can start chatting in a bus and talking to normal people. And uh, when you leave, you're a human being and you need other human beings. You, I mean, and personally, he is not looking for a house or for a comfortable place or 
to be sustained by the government. He needs a nice place where to stay with nice people. And he thinks Italy is a really nice place. What do you do now in Italy? Do you, are you continuing to pursue your interest in journalism? And second question is, he mentioned that his dad lived in Rome. What was his dad doing in Rome? Okay. Um, so first question. He, he works currently as a hotel receptionist, but he, look, he also is interested in, in following his dreams and writing his, uh, he tries, he tries, you know, to also, he would like to work a bit more on that, but um, mainly, yeah, his main job is, is uh, he earns his living doing, uh, being as a receptionist. Um, as the second question, uh, it's really interesting because he da his dad, you know, Eritrea was under Italian colonization at a certain point of history, and uh, his dad was the first black man to marry an Italian woman. A black, mo and it's quite interesting because um, imagine a Muslim uh, black man mar getting married, and, uh, you know, a Catholic Italian white woman. It was quite, it was quite, quite weird for that, for that time for those, yeah, those times yeah. and um, so he was he came to Italy basically and he lived in Bologna and uh, that's why he was in Italy and then from here he had to change with I mean he was leading the company so he was he went to uh, Saudi Arabia um, you said that you came here with 28 other people do you still keep in contact with them and if so where Oops. are they now he's in touch with all of them his dream would be Organizing a gathering in the place where they reached in Lampedusa every year to remember that, that day. Uh, but it's, I mean, they have job constraints, so it's not really easy to organize it. But um, he is also, on top of his job, he's also um, a, a, an activist for human rights activists. So he travels a lot throughout, I mean, in, in Europe, and he goes and, uh, and he visits almost all of them. But he's quite in touch with everyone. So given everything that you went through in the entire journey and the people that you came with, if somebody asked you from Eritrea today, like if they should make the journey, would you recommend it? So when you take such choice, he's talking about his personal choice, it's really a tough one, right? And, um, and you have to make it only because you can't bear it anymore. The situation is, the, the pressure is too much and you can't bear it. Personally, he would not recommend, but what he says is you can't even tell what, it, what you went through because this kind of experience, you're able to understand it only by personally living it. So he has no clue on how to explain what he had to go through. It's, it's a long story, it's a very deep story, it's a very sad situation. So they only have to go through it to understand what they have to go through. You talked about uh, Libyan situation. Uh, you know that uh, some years ago, our prime minister tried to make a sort of uh, collaboration with uh, Gaddafi to regulate uh, migration to Italy. And uh, we were, uh, we can say we were friend of, uh, Italy was a friend of, uh, of Gaddafi. Uh, have you ever thought, uh, no, I don't want to go to Italy because uh, they were a friend of Gaddafi. So migration, says, migration is part of the human history. It's part of the human history. We mean all the human history went through migration. And uh, it's inevitable. They can't, it's not made of agreements and papers. They can sign in papers. But they will never be able to stop the real flow. Because why they're leaving the country, they have the reasons, they have the pressure behind. So even if they can make agreements, if they can allocate funds to stop the migration, they will never be able. Because the reason why people are fleeing their country is too strong to be, to be kept by this, by this legal sort of framework or, or agreements. So whatever they do is really irrelevant into, in practical terms. And to come to your question, for this reason, I, I, I really, he really doesn't bother what happens between two governments because what, as he said before, what he's interested is in is in the Italian people, is in the Italian culture, the Italian warm, warm attitude. That's what he was looking for, and he's found it. 
So um, I have a question about uh, the Eritrean community in Rome. Um, could you describe for us um, what it's what kind of community there is for Eritreans, uh, immigrants that live in Rome, and whether or not you were um, involved in that community, and what kind of relationship you have with other Eritreans? So okay. when we talk about the Eritrean community in Rome, um, they can be divided into two. There's one part who supports the regime, who supports the government, who go to the parties of the government, they're, you know, they're, they're, and they're okay with what's happening there. And there's another part of young people who, like him who suffered, who knows, who suffered the same pain, who knows what, what it means going through the whole the whole trip, and uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do something. They're activists. They're trying to go against it. They try to sensitize people of what's happening there, what kind of human violations uh, are being done, what kind of rights are being violated. So he is, he is part of the second part of, of community, and uh, he wants to support the, the movement, and uh, you know, he, he wants to do something. Um, through your activism, is there any movement or kind of a way for the people who have made it here to Italy or Europe um, to change the situation in the countries of origin that people are leaving to escape these human rights violations and these terrible situations? Is there any way to try to fix that, those situations? There, there are movements. Young people, they gather themselves and uh, they do cultural well, events and... Um, and there's also a political movement for change. They try to struggling for change, to sensitize, and uh, they're not only people who, who crossed the, the Red Sea, but there are also Italians or you know, many different people they can and support. But um, those who, um, who were here for a long time, and they didn't really see the change, what's happening in there, what's, what, what kind of pain people are suffering. They don't understand. And we're talking about the other part of Eritreans who support the government and the regime. So what happens basically is really difficult because they don't, they, don't, they don't have any idea of what's happening there and they blindly support the regime. And this is a, a big challenge because they're organizing parties, they're organizing also cultural events and it's quite difficult to, you know, to make them understand that they, they shouldn't be following that line that they should, they should be moving against. Have you ever thought about uh, uh, coming back to live in your country in the future? As, the, as she introduced it very well, he was born abroad. He, in his country, what we call his country, Eritrea, he lived there only for seven years. So he didn't really have enough time to save her what it means being at home, and half of his life was actually abroad. And this is the first time that he's feeling at home here in Italy. So if he thinks to go back to Eritrea, okay, but it's only seven years. Imagine half of his lifetime, he spent it abroad, and this is where he feels home, who he considers home. On the, on the question of the immigration, here in Italy, I mean, of the opinion of the Italian politician. Uh, What's the question again? Sorry, no, it's not I missed me. it. I didn't if uh, it. he's interested about, about this, about the political opinion. Uh, the Italian political debate on immigration? Yeah. So there is a debate in Italy oh, about okay. immigration. Oh, that okay. is all over the newspapers. Okay, like sorry, today there was clear. Salvini, who is the leader of the Northern League, which is yeah. this kind of xenophobic kind of guy. Okay. And today it's all over the newspaper that he's saying things, we should shut down all these centri okay. di accoglienza, yeah. these places where okay. refugees are processed, okay. and because they're, they're incoming enormous waves, right? This is what you're referring to. And so okay. when he was referring to the Italian politicians on immigration, he, was he wanted to know from Amr what's okay. his opinion about this. Okay. Like In a I utopic world, the, the European Union, like Denmark and Germany, and Germany uh, all the members of the European Union should yeah. be there in Lampedusa and the take their share of migrants. But this is not happening. So all the all the workload is is being left to is being left to Italy, and it's quite understandable that, that politicians exploit this situation to serve their own propaganda. To serve, I mean, this is not something new. 
When That's your neighbor is like making a lot of noise, you have to do something. When, when, when you have lots of problems in your house, you have to do something. And what politicians normally do, and this is not new, is try to exploit the situation, you know, to make their own, their own, their own strategy. And this is a communication strategy from the North League or Savini or whoever he is. He's just exploiting the situation to, you know, to, to, to get more, 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 you know, to get the opinion to get more votes. Yeah, exactly. Both <laughs> and... You need a euro, you Well, uh, yeah, and this is, in this case, you know, European Union is not only Italy. They should be really sharing this problem. They should be part of yeah. the solution, and they're not. So it's quite understandable for you. I'm Radam, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.